for it to succeed. So we're going to talk about that quite a bit today. First, though, I wanted to point out to you that the University of New Mexico University program has had a lot of classes this year. We started with how to generate a business idea in Gallup, pitching and presenting your idea in Los Lunas, marketing analysis at the main campus, and today we're doing the business model campus from Los Alamos. We do have a class coming up on June 24th called Design Thinking, and that's going to be presented on the main campus. If you go to www.stc.unm.edu, you will find the list of all the various programs that we're working on. And there are two contacts, actually, for the program to learn more about what we're doing, Kara Mickelson and Cecilia Pacheco. And you can find both of them if you go to the STC and you look under contacts. You can find both of them. I just happen to have uh, Kara up here today. Questions, you can also send it to info at stc.unm.edu. So be looking for all the seminars. Cecilia and I were just talking about a student who has gone through every seminar, every university program, attended i -Corps, lives in Gallup, and the success she's had with launching her company. So we know that this program works. We'd like to see you take advantage of it. So let's start talking about the business model canvas. Uh, well, actually, I'm putting in a little thing about myself and why I use the business model canvas. The business model canvas helps me do a couple of different things as an angel investor and as a, a techno geek and as somebody who's run lots of tech companies. It helps me exploit the latest technological developments with the right business model. We're going to talk about how you do this to get the right business model. It helps me figure out with the person that I'm coaching, whether or not there are any unaddressed customer needs, and to build the business model around that. And here's the point that we mentioned the last time in market analysis, which is you're going to be surprised to the extent that your client determines what your actual product is. And then it helps me make the decision about it with others, both VCs and other angels, about whether or not a company is ready for investment. Because we look at the business model and we say, is it competitive with the other companies who may have something similar maybe doing, or if it's totally disruptive, can we use a really creative business model to get it to market? Something we have never used before. So let's talk about entrepreneurial spirit. I don't know uh, exactly the moment that I discovered I had an entrepreneurial spirit, but it happened somewhere along the two, year 2000. And that was after I realized that for Los Alamos National Lab, the University of California, San Diego, I was starting up brand new operations for them. And I said to myself, why don't I do this thing called tech startup? And my first tech startup was with the gentleman who uh, invented and created video streaming via the World Wide Web. And yeah, that's the truth. They still own all the international patents on it. So here's some questions for you. Are you an entrepreneurial spirit? Yes or no? There's no maybe in there, okay? Are you constantly thinking about how to create value and build new businesses or how to improve or transfer your organization? Now, many people who work in large organizations like both the national labs, larger companies, universities, have responsibility for bringing changes to those organizations. And this thing about the business model can be helpful there as well. A little bit done a little bit differently, but can be helpful there. And are you trying to find innovative ways of doing business to replace old, outdated ones? And that's where we get into the idea that there are some really creative ways of building a business model and actually selling brand new products. I always tell everybody that by definition, when you come up with something that nobody else is doing, everything you're doing is disruptive, and your business model might as well be disruptive as well. So here are some resources for you to look at after today's class. Um, they're all available on Amazon. The one of the three that's in limited numbers at this point is business model generation. It was self-published in 2009. It's available only in used copies. You can get it electronically for $2,000. But if you get the used copies, they're 31. This is quite $31. This is quite a treasure. It talks about how to build a business model. The Lean Entrepreneur, and it's written by Alexander Osterwalder. It's actually done by a group of Dutch entrepreneurs. The Lean Entrepreneur is written by a guy by the name of Brant Cooper from San Diego. He's a colleague of mine. And it totally has to do with if you're doing a disruptive product that's brand new and nobody else has done it, then what you're actually doing is you've got to come up with a way of getting it to market. And he talks about the really innovative ways you can do that, how you can figure out what your markets are, how you can divide up your customer segments, and how you can go out and talk with them. 
The Art of the Start 2.0 is like having a conversation with Guy Kawasaki, one of the founders of Apple. He, when he was with Apple, I think about six years, uh, he and Steve Jobs didn't get along with one another after a while. But Guy admits he made some mistakes in treat, treating a small company like it was a big company. And so one of the things he does in The Art of the Start is he takes all everything he's learned and puts it into a, a long conversation, but a very short book. I think the parts about how you pick the people you work with in this book are absolutely essential for any entrepreneur. So to summarize, we've got a book on a business model and how to do that, a book on how to be a lean entrepreneur and do lean marketing, and The Art of the Start, which is a conversation with somebody who's done this hundreds of times. So look for those on Amazon, they are available. A business model canvas. Some of you have seen this before, especially if you were in the workshop with me last time about talking to customers. The business model canvas, if you just put it in, can be found online. You can print it off yourself. Uh, this one has to be by Strategizer. Strategizer worked with the Dutch team to put together this particular way the model is expressed. It is a tool, and when you look at it, it's one page. Now, you're looking at me going, but aren't, don't I have to write a business plan? Not necessarily in your initial state of the funding, but we do have to have an executive su summary. And this business model will help you write that. So business model is simple. It's got a bunch of boxes. We're going to go through them, and, and you won't need to have that in front of you to do that. When it's completed, it describes the rationale of how you create, deliver, and capture value. So keep in mind that your entire plan for your business isn't about the technology. It's about how you're going to create value for your customer. And that is a hard concept to get our, eye, our arms, eyes, ears, and brain around when what we're doing is thinking to ourselves, but my technology's not done. I can't sell anything until it's done. Yet the very business model that you use to get it out there and get the money you need to finish it doesn't emphasize the technology. It emphasizes the value, and as you'll see later, cost and potential revenues. It requires deep research. You've got to define your great idea and its value. It, your MVP, your minimal value proposition, it involves interviewing numerous potential customers. In the I-Core program, we ask students to do between 25 and 100. Last, this past semester that just ended last week, we had one group that got 60 of these done. And it also has to do with the business model. So when you're all done and you've got this thing written out in terms of value and revenues and costs, how are you going to sell it? Now that becomes the creative part. This is a great idea, and we're going to use it as the basis of some of our discussion today. Um, you probably have an idea. If you've got your own idea, as we're talking, what I'd like you to do is write down every single solitary creative idea that comes through your head. You are sitting in a classroom, uh, I'm not there, and I would like you to just, oh, I could do this, write it down. Or I could do this, write it down. Do that the whole way through. Don't lose those thoughts, because what I find is when I'm brainstorming with myself, later on I go, oops, what was I thinking? So capture, okay? We're going to use this story, because it's quite a good story, and to be honest with you, I saw it on the news last night. There's a guy by the name of John Miller who has a company that one of the set of restaurants is called Flipping Burgers, and then he, and he has another thing called Cali Burger. Basically, he wants to make his restaurants more consistent in terms of product that they're turning out. He wants to lower his labor costs. He also wants to be able to turn out a high product that everybody goes to and orders much in the same way that everybody goes to Amazon looking for so many different things. He firmly believes that this is the key to success for fast food companies. He's using robotics. He's got this great little robot with two arms that sits on this little platform, goes up to the grill, and flips burgers. Puts cheese on them, gets the same cooking temperature the whole way through, and then a human comes up, and the robot turns, hands all the burger, the uh, meat, to that person who then puts the hamburgers together. Um, one of the other things he wanted to do is he wanted to be able to pay his employees more money. And he wanted some consistency in his staffing as well because he had very high turnover. And in fact, he's achieved that. His ma magic sauce, this is business model and how he's doing it. His other piece of his magic sauce is the software that is inside that robot. Now, the robot can't do everything. They don't have the creative thinking we do, the problem solving we do, happiness quotient, yeah, it can talk. But it was programmed by us. And what's happening, as well as 
the robot doing the burgers, the robot's learning from the human being and bringing in information and data that the robot uses to do a better job. So they, the term we use to define this is called cobiotics. So he has a software that employs cobiotics and involves a human being being involved with the robot to produce hamburgers. And cobiotics, according to John, is the future, but there's another big gorilla out there who also thinks it's part of it, and that's Amazon. Um, I was stunned to learn, I knew they were using robots, but I was thinking it was a robot that trailed alongside them while they walked across the warehouse and put something over here. In fact, they do have those. They have something that's probably as tall as I am, about that wide with shelves in it and sections. And if all of us were to order a pound of Folgers coffee, it would go into those sections with a pre-printed label saying each one of our names, it gets dumped into a box. And as it's being carried across the warehouse, it stays inside there. And there's a little robot that's very flat underneath it to lose the shelf. And that is who the co the coworker or human being can talk to to say, follow me here. Now that's pretty amazing stuff as far as I'm concerned. What both Amazon and John are saying is that why would you want to separate automation from packages? And why would you not want to have human workers working with robots? What's interesting to me is that Amazon claims that since they started doing this at their fulfillment centers and they've really expanded their business, and you know you can buy cloud storage from them, you can buy coffee from them, you can build, get house building materials from them or a prefab house, you know that they're selling a lot of stuff. They're the big gorilla out there. They've hired 300,000 people in the United States since they started using robotics. Now keep in mind, let's go back to John, his value proposition has to do with a robot that prepares foods in his restaurants, creating consistency and more customers and allowing customers to order online so that he can pay his employees more and have some retention. So here's our business model canvas. Let's go over what the segments are that are on it. And we will repeat these many times, so you're not going to have to have anything in front of you. But I'm going to do them in the order that I think they're important. Value proposition. One of the hardest things to do is describe what your product's going to do for your customer. What's it going to cost? What kind of revenues are you going to make? What kind of, how is it going to save them money? How is it going to save them time? How is it going to help them reach their goal? Customer segments. Now this is interesting. People, when they tell me customer segments, start writing them down. They'll write down 10, 12, 13, 14. Tell me there's not enough room and pile stickies on top of one another. That's great. There are products out there that will go to a mass market. And in our particular case, if we focus on John's company, we have a mass market for hamburgers. We know that his customers think his hamburgers are good, and they're being cooked by robots. But that's not his market. He actually has a dual market. He has a multifaceted market. He's got a market that is the people eating his hamburgers, and then he's got other people who are flipping hamburgers, companies that are flipping hamburgers. He's got two markets. What we want to do is focus our markets. We don't want to have so many markets up there. We can't get our minimal viable product. Now, so first, we want to define our value proposition, then our customer segments. Well, then what do we want to do next? We want to talk about customer relationships. What do customers want out of us? Now we're here, we know what the segments are, but what do they want? What value do they see in what it is we're doing? What are they willing to pay? How will they use it? And how do we find that out? We interview them, and it goes back to what I talked about, that in my core, we ask our students to uh, conduct at least 25 to 100 interviews with real live people, mostly in person, over the phone, if that's the only way they can do it. Channels, who are the people who are gonna use this actual product they can help us get it to market. Now that's what I was talking about up here with the hamburger company. You and I are going to buy hamburgers from these flipping burgers in Caliburger, okay? But remember we said that there's a group of people who are actually going to use it in their own stores and that the magic sauce that John can sell, license, um, let people buy uh, manufactured machines for their usage, those are the channels. Those are the people who actually are going to use it. They're part of his market, okay? So then we have to say to ourselves, well, what else is on these things? Revenue streams. Where's the money going to come from? Is it going to come from these two areas? How do we know that both customers, what are customers going to have to pay? How much money are we going to have to make? How much money are we going to have to make from our channels? Okay, so revenue streams. Over here, 
we have some different things. Key partners. Our key partners are those people who are going to help us get this to market. A good example would be a student who was in, uh, in um, i last time around who had developed something for doping fiber cables. I know that sounds weird, but doping fiber cables so that there's connectivity consistently between your cell phone and mine. And who was going to be his key partner? It turned out his key partner were going to be the people who are already doing that, but doing it in a much more costly and different way. And he called them up on the phone and said, you want to stay interested in what I'm doing? They said, absolutely. Now, key activities and key resources. I'm going to go to key resources last, um, along with cost structure, I'm going to go to key activities. When we put together our business model canvas, we might have on here, what's our business model going to be? How are we going to sell? How much is it going to cost? How do we know? Okay. Over here, under cost structure, that's four different areas. That's human resources, that's manufacturing, that's the cost of parts, and that's the cost of distribution. And when we figure out how we're going to do that, it helps us pick our business model. And when somebody's looking at investing in your company, they're taking a look at, yes, your value to your customer and how you found that out, which was your interviews, your, who your customers are going to be, and those people who want to be your channels and those people who want to be your key partners. We're also going to look at cost structure, and that helps us figure out whether or not you're ready for investment. Because these things, have, we have to have our due diligence. We have to do the best we can in figuring these things out. The big question is, how do we know? That then says to us, what are the resources we need? What's our apps? How much money do we need? Um, if we're going to be developing robots, and each one of those robots is in John's hamburger thing, uh, company right now, it's about 40000 a piece. Then where are we going to get 40000 from? And is there any margin on that that we can use to invest in other kinds of robotics that we need for our fast food restaurants, which is also one of his goals. So the business model, as you can see, is a decision-making matrix. And I've had people say to me, I'm just going to sit down alone and I'm going to work on this and I'm going to fill it in and I'm going to ask you questions. What I always recommend is that this is a collaborative tool. Print it on the hugest piece of paper you can get. Even go to a mouse printer. Don't write on it. Get stickies. And in class today, we got stickies. Little tiny stickies. And every idea you get is brainstormed and just placed in one of those segments. Um, I wish I believed that human beings could focus on just one section. You're going to be thinking of things across all the sections all the time. So that's why the stickies. You just write them down, you put them there, and that way you don't lose them. Because don't forget, I'd ask you if you'll please take notes while I'm speaking. Okay, so I don't know whether we've got any questions from any of the campuses about the business model canvas. Do we have any questions so far? None? Okay, I'm going to move on. So all those things that I was showing you are what are called building blocks. What value do we deliver to the customer? It's one of the most important questions you can ask when you're deciding what the value proposition is. And the answer to a lot of the time is, well, I think it's going to help them get better tasting hamburgers because it's tasty because everything was cooked the same way. Well, that's my perspective, and I'm the person building the robot. What does the customer have to say? Um, there are a lot of restaurants in countries like Japan that are using robots, and the Japanese are fascinated by them, and the restaurants are doing quite well. But there are also people in Japan who are going, I like to talk to my waiter. It's part of my eating experience. And if I need fast food, that works for me, but if I'm going to have a dining experience, I don't want the son now yay, the person who's bringing me very expensive and bread wine, to be a robot. So, which one of our customers' problems are we helping to solve? We've got two groups of customers now, the people who own the restaurants and the people who are eating them. Okay? We want the customers who are eating there to have an uninterrupted but a touch-friendly experience with us so they feel like they're being taken care of. Um, and our customers want to lower their costs. They want to lower their costs of delivery. They want to lower their costs of personnel. They want to lower their turnover. We already know that because we've done some research on that. What bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? Aha, uh -huh. is the robot going to be delivered all ready for your business? How does it know your business? How is it going to learn your business? Who's going to train it to do your business? Not all fast food companies run the same, okay? And if you, there was a photograph I saw just recently of a fast food restaurant in Japan 
where there are almost no human beings, and the food was being delivered by these little robots that were very small squat with little round faces that talked, and they were running all over the place and then lifting up a tray and putting it on the table. So what services do we offer that owner of that restaurant so that their robots keep on working because, you know, technical stuff breaks down. So what are we going to do? What products and services are we going to offer? What training are we going to offer? What levels are we going to offer? What computer levels are we going to offer? Are we going to do their iCloud storage? Are we going to do their data? Are we going to do their costs? And are we going to do their billing? What are we doing for our customers? Which customer needs them are we satisfying? And that's that list I just gave you. We have to figure this out when we think about the value proposition. So if we go back to the example of our hamburger shop that's got robots cooking hamburgers, we're providing consistency in product so that we can reduce costs, increase margins, and reduce employee turnover by creating the cobot situation where they're working together. Now, then what's interesting is when Amazon's employees were interviewed on this, some people think they're being asked to go to work and not think all day long, the robots do it all. But at John's place, the employees still believe they're running the show because the uh, robots watch them, bring in data, and they're able to train the robots in a lot more different decision-making models. So we have to be able to figure out, are we going to do that kind of software and how expensive is that going to be? Because that's AI with each installation. How is it going to be modified? What is a standard robot? For whom are we creating value? Okay, so the second building block is customer segments. This is the one that everybody goes, oh my god, everybody in the world needs my robot that cooks hamburgers. No, they don't. <laughs> There's still going to be some places that aren't going to want them, number one. And number two, because of how they're laid out, we're not going to be able to put them in place. We have to know where our robot fit, fills in, fits in. And that your product, you've got to know how it fits in to existing business models. Now, does that limit you to existing business models? No. You may be offering a new and a better way. And that may be the second product that you're actually offering, which is your software and a new business model for how to deliver consistent, good tasting food in fast food restaurants. We have to say who are our most important uh, customers, and, it, and this is an interesting question because is it a mass market? Is it a niche market? Is it a segmented market? Is it diversified? Or is it a multi-sided platform? Most multi-sided platforms have to do with banks. You know as well as I do, you probably have a Bank of America or Wells Fargo or First National Bank or New Mexico Credit Union or Sandia Credit Union card that you just put into a scanner and it pays for your whatever it is you're doing, of course you have to have money. But, so you're a customer, but the vendors themselves are customers. And one of the things they like to complain about, and it's probably quite accurate, is the fee they have to pay to the banks for having the card service. So there are two big customers, meaning there's a multi-sided platform. One that has to give business reports to the customer, and one that has to send the information to the bank so that I can read and see what I spent money on. Mass market needs of many kinds of users, and, and what's funny is almost everybody starts out with the idea that their product is going to meet a mass market need. Um, I'll tell you, I've worked on uh, particle accelerator parts, and when you have a coupler that's going to help you increase uh, the use of the beam inside the particle accelerator, that's now mass market, okay? It's a niche market. And, oh, what would it be used on? Uh, various neutron therapies, um, embedding gases into... Uh, um, chips for semiconductors, all kinds of things like that. But that's not a mass market. That's a very specific market. So mass market, we really have to define, is it really a mass market? Okay. Niche market, that would be what I just described. Segmented market means that actually um, it can be used first with a specific group of people like fast food uh, restaurants then larger chains, then maybe it could actually be used with uh, boutique restaurants that are very high end, okay? So that's what we mean by segmented. It's the same market as a whole, but it has different sections and ways in which food is prepared and served. That can also be true of other kinds of technologies. And then diversified, man, they're totally unrelated. Um, 
Amazon does a wonderful thing. It sells tons of books to all of us. We, and if we have Prime memberships, we get those books in two days, right, from a, a, a distribution center somewhere. Well, it also offers, offers cloud services. Did you know that the companies that don't have cloud service? Just like Facebook, they have great big server farms and you can rent time from them. So that's totally unrelated. Yes, they have everything on, in their service farms. That's how they get the data about what you want and then find out and, and record that they've actually delivered it. But if I don't have cloud services from my company, I can rent space, rent space from them. And that is not related to their core business. But it works because they have so many big, huge service server parts. So that is what we're talking about, customer segments. And that is important to know. And you're saying to me, oh my god, I don't know. Well, yeah, that's right. You're, why are you going to do research? And why are you going to ask people? You may sit down and talk with a Susan Cornelius who was invested in companies. And you may say to her, this is what I think my segments are. And ask me the questions about what I think the value of this thing would be. And you might talk to Cecilia Pacheco and ask her the same question. You might talk to Dr. Wayne Cornelius from Raytheon Missile Systems and ask him the same questions. But the thing of it is, we want you to talk to people who you suspect are in your market segments that are actually selling or doing the work and ask them those questions. How do you do that? Well, I have a funny story that I told in the last class, which is one of my students um, gets a business card that everybody needs and then connects with them on LinkedIn. He wrote a hundred letters and everybody said, oh, nobody's going to respond. And he did 60 interviews. So everybody responded. They liked this bright and shiny PhD student who had this wonderful idea about fiber optics. And the next building block is channels. Now, how do our customers get reached? What's really interesting is that most people don't realize that pharmaceuticals are not just sold straight to hospitals. There are actually something called pharmaceutical reps who meet with one another informally in every city in which they exist. They all work with different companies and they keep track of one another because if I'm selling a certain kind of antibiotic, you're selling a certain kind of arthritis medicine, and you're selling a certain kind of depression med or bipolar med, we want to know where there's opportunities for us to move in. So we meet on a regular basis and we each represent other companies, typically more than one, okay? And we are the ones doing the sales on behalf of those companies to the hospitals, and the hospitals buy them in large amounts, and we manage to negotiate you know, big discounts for them. So we're a channel. That's a good example of a channel. Have you ever been in Albuquerque to this great big supply, uh, auto supply store that's on Rio Grande near Old Town? It sells every piece of every brand new car that you would want to buy. And I'm going to tell you, it's inexpensive. It just sells everything you need. So if you can afford to replace your bumper, that's where the auto repair shop is getting it from. That's the channel. They buy either aftermarket from companies who produce them at lower price, or they buy directly from the car manufacturers themselves. And when they buy from them, they're buying parts from countries like China and New Mexico. Excuse me, Mexico. All right. So how are they reaching them now? Well, there's some good questions. What channels do you use in your business to get what you need? How are you reaching them? Do you talk to them? Do you have representatives? Do you write them emails? Do you just order online? What do you do? How are your channels integrated? Oh, that's an interesting question. I have to get the screws for my robot from one company. I have to get the service servers for my robot from another company. Which ones are the most cost effective? Now, that is something we don't always know when we're starting out. If we're drawing in some kind of package that has suggests vendors to buy our parts from, that's, that's helpful. But it's not always the best price. Who are the ones that are going to be the most cost effective to give us the parts for our robot? And how are we integrating them with our customer routines? Oh, now this is really interesting. Working with a student who was buying smoke bombs from China and shipping them from China to the United States. This company is called, oh, I just based Kyle's company's name. Shutter Bombs. It's called Shutter Bombs. You'll see it online if you look for it. And Shutter Bombs relies on getting these smoke bombs from Europe. They're one of the only companies, I mean, from China. They're one of the only companies on Amazon that is permitted to do that. And they had to figure out what their buying cycle was along with their selling cycle because they needed to have enough supplies because the demand was really high. And $11 per each one of those smoke bombs, colored smoke bombs, for it. and what are they using for photography and getting dramatic effects? He had to integrate what he was selling and when he was selling it 
the plan his channel to get it to him. Four key building blocks, customer relationships. Well, this is a big question. When we're sitting down and interviewing them and we're thinking to ourselves, our product isn't even done, we're actually asking them if you used our rob robot to flip eggs, pancakes, bacon, hamburgers, whatever it is you're flipping on your, on your grills. Oh, I forgot my favorite thing in the whole wide world, tortillas. If you're flipping them on the grill uh, and you want to use one of our robots, um, what kind of relationship do you want to have with us? Do you want us to stop by on a regular basis and make sure your new personnel are being trained? How much are you willing to pay for that? If we already have a relationship with them, everybody will say to me, we don't have a relationship with them. Oh, yes, you do. You just held an interview with them. Okay? And how is what they want going to integrate with the rest of our business model? Are we going to be like Facebook and all the help you need is online? And even though you may want to talk to a real life person, you cannot. Or we can have real life people that go in there. And how costly are these services going to be? Ah, that's where the customer is going to say, I'd rather do it online and be able to chat with you because that's cheaper than if I have to bring somebody in. Okay? So that's what customer relations are about. The services they want from us and how much they going to cost. All right, any questions from any of the campuses? You're thinking. All right, let's go on to the next one. Our number five building cost is revenue streams. Oh my goodness, this is a hard one. Everybody says to me this is the hardest question to ask of a potential customer, which is, what are they willing to pay for what I've got? I talked with one company that had a device that they were using to clarify water after a natural disaster. And they were thinking it would cost 50000 and they were really worried the customer wouldn't pay that because they were hoping that this was going to go to disaster areas where, where the, perhaps the level of everyday living is not, it's been totally destroyed. And gosh, are they going to be willing to pay for it? And that's an important question for them. Well, the answer is they're not going to be able to get the investors if they don't have some kind of a margin on it. So the answer to this question is what are they willing to pay based on the value proposition I gave? You've done a good job of the value proposition. Even bat and I at, at, at a, some kind of lease or some kind of rental or some kind of purchase of a $60,000 robot, not $40,000. Um, what do they currently pay? Well, if you take a look at the salary of an employee at $17,000 a year, 30% of that in benefits, if they do provide benefits, or the cost of their turnover, and they can have a robot who's not going to quit its job and it's going to keep on flipping pancakes, and you'll be able to put more people into facing the customer and finding out if the experience is good and paying people for that and get some kind of loyalty going on, mm, they might be willing to pay more. So let's find that out. How would they prefer to pay? Um, I've heard of companies whipping out a credit card and paying $2 million for something, but most of them do not. So they want to pay over time. They want an advantageous contract. They want a discounted cost if they buy more than one. And if you're talking about McDonald's, it probably has 500 McDonald's in the state of California alone. Yeah, they're looking for some kind of group discount rate. So do we know what that's going to be? And how much does each revenue stream contribute to the overall revenues? Now, we remember, we talked about banks. I do my banking at Bank of America, let's say. And I, am, I pay a, a something to them per month because one of the services they give me is all these whistles and bills that I can do online. But the vendor is paying 2 to 10 percent on everything that they sell, 2 to 5 percent, I guess, on everything that they sell. Are they willing to do that? So what is, if there are multiple parties in your revenue stream, what are they willing to pay to be a part of it? And how much do you have to pay them? Now, I realize this is kind of dry. I'm trying to make it exciting. Let's see if I can succeed in that. So who would your key partners be? I had an incredible experience last week. Got to go um, to a world cheer competition at Disney World. And the reason why I went was not just, oh, I wanted to see it. My grandson, uh, Justin, is actually an NCAA collegiate champion. And he was competing in Worlds, which is a big deal because for the first time in 2022, we're sending a cheer team to Korea. Now, you'd say to yourself, for the Olympics, you'd say to yourself, international? <sighs> international? There were teams from there from Japan, from China, from Australia, 
from England, from France, from all over the Pacific and the Atlantic. There was a team here from Barbados. You'd be amazed at how far the whole concept of tier has gone as people develop their universities. So we were, we were saying to ourselves, key partners, aha, one of the key partners was the International Association. One was its vendors, okay? One were the cheer clubs themselves. One were the governments of those countries who were committing the students to leave to compete in this and represent the country because they were world-class teams. So what you've got to say to yourself is, who's going to make it possible for me to do what I do? Who out there is going to manufacture my robot? Do I have to have special spatulas to flip the hamburgers because the robot can't go like this like I can or flip it up in the air and catch it like I can't. The robot has to go and turn it over like I was watching the movement it was making. So who are going to be our key partners in making sure we have all the things that, have, that creates that robot? We've got the magic sauce, the software, but we still need to have partners to get, make parts for us. Who are our key suppliers? This robot was covered. I don't know how many of you saw iRobot. Um, but in that, the digitally represented robots had a very soft rubber that you could almost see through. It was over the outside of their body parts and reflected emotion and thoughts and whether they were angry or attacking. This robot actually had that as well, okay? And so um, he wasn't attacking the hamburgers, believe me. What key resources are we, are we acquiring from partners? What do we have to get from them? So, and which key activities do the partners perform? Are the partners going to do the shaping and everything? Okay, so I, I just discovered you can't see me when I'm standing over there, so I'm going to have to move over here. So I'm not a disembodied voice. So we need to know what we need from suppliers, from partners, from all the people we're going to have a business relationship with to create our product. Key activities. This is my favorite. Sometimes people will say to me, well, I don't know the answer to who our customers are. That goes into key activities. Um, but here's the ones I think need to be in there. Who are our distribution channels? How are, we, how are we distributing this product? What customer relationships do we have to have? That's the whole question about how, you know, what do customers expect from us? What kind of service and products? Are we going to do production and manufacturing? Are we going to send overseas somewhere? Um, and I'm not recommending either. There's a lot of um, made, made in America going on right now to try to bring stuff back to the United States. But can we do it in the United States? Can we do it in Mexico, China? Where can we do it? Problem solving. We can have a product development team that when a customer has a problem with a product, are we going to have to develop that team? That's going to be hiring human resources and training them not only in how the product works and the software works, but when to create manuals that say when this and such happens and it's online, they can go to it, look at it and say, ooh, that's what I'm seeing. Or to contact us when they're working with the customer online to say, hey, we need a patch for this, okay? And what kind of platform or network are we going to put it on? Are we going to go to Amazon and buy our cloud services? Are we going to work with Facebook? Are we going to work with Reddit? Who are we going to do that with? Or are we going to own it ourselves? So that key building block is key activities. It's not I haven't done all the other stuff but it can be that when you're first working on it. Let me make a point. You're going to change your business model canvas probably three to seven to ten times. Everybody's worried that it's not perfect when they show it to me, and I look at them because I'm mentoring the program and say, I wasn't expecting it. And it was really funny. I was working with a team this past semester who went, oh, we can't make money this way. And they totally changed their business model. Instead of selling a lens, they picked up data points and showed them where satellites were during daytime. They decided, since they already knew how to use a software, they're going to be a software service on the cloud that people can come to them in less than 20 minutes. They can say, oops, five satellites in this country changed direction. They're lowering, and we think they're going to fire something. So those they totally got away from selling anything that was manufactured and totally into delivering data. Key partners, well, that, these are the guys that may be everything from um, distributing things for us, they're going to make some money and they, we get, may give them a discount. Our key suppliers, and what we're, again, we're repeating what are we acquiring from our partners and which key activities the partners perform for us. But be really clear what we're really worried about is the motivators for the partners. We've got to be able to tell them this is what they're going to get out of it optimization, some kind of economy, 
reduction of risk, uncertainty we're going to get to on a regular basis. All their fast food restaurants are going to be really happy with our robots. And we might even acquire a robot maker, some a company out there that's like uh, Troy, Troy Robotics in Chicago. We're going to buy all their supplies and we're going to we're going to actually be the place that distributes those at the same time. Oh, now we have an even bigger multifaceted company. Cost structure. Oh my goodness, the number of times companies have told me, I hate this. I don't know this. No, you don't. You're going to be talking to your customers, figure out what they want and need. And this is going to be one of the last things you do. Um, everybody's always worried. I, I can't even figure out how much this device is going to cost, what margins to put into it. And I always tell them, if your margin's too low, you're going to have problems with investors. But it's case by case, product by product. And I have a tendency to roll product and service into one word. I use the word just product. So I'm talking about services as well. What are the most important costs inherent in your business model? Initially, building our robots, it's going to be innovation engineers, solutions engineers, software people. Okay? Initially, that's going to be one of our costs. Over time, as the team learns, we may not need as many of them. We may even have some of them initially as consultants. Which key resources are the most expensive? Is it our human resources? Or is it the fabrication of this very special robot? Which key activities are the most expensive? How expensive is our marketing and sales? Um, had a funny situation with one of our students here who would, had come up with a software app. His first attempt to sell his software app was highly successful. What did he do? It was just him. He went around with a template that he could cover with a felt pen, and he went into every classroom he could find at UNM with permission, and he colored over it with his marker and left the thing that said, go to Pencil In, go to this website, buy my software, and then he did a TED Talk. It's what we call guerrilla marketing. It's not the same thing as what we sometimes think of as marketing. So the cost of marketing means that when we start up a company and there's only two to five members on it, Everybody there has got to understand the product, product and be able to market it and has to contact people and let them know where we are with stuff. And every client we interviewed, when we were asking, are you interested in our robot, becomes a potential client for our company. And we have to keep them informed of what it is we're doing. That's called marketing. It's not the flyer that we stick on the wall. Okay? So what you end up deciding to put in here, um, if you want a very lean, low-cost structure in terms of your costs, in your cost structure. You're going to do some things differently. My husband and I had one company that we did uh, it, it, um, engineering of very niche kinds of things for particle accelerators to make them uh, more effective, to make signal more effective. Um, we actually didn't own an office building or an office that we rented. Everybody that worked with us worked out of their own personal offices. And yes, we had to do all the things under California law to make those, sure those offices were safe. And when we had our final meetings with the Department of Energy, we actually had them at our house, and everybody was worried, oh my God, what is the director of the Department of Energy going to think? He comes walking in through the front door, sees none of us have our shoes on. He says, in my culture, I get this. He takes his shoes off. He sits at the dining room table with the projector, with the computers, with the presentations that every team member was doing. And then he says, can I see the device? We send him out to the garage. He goes out to the garage. He comes in laughing because we gave him booties to put on his feet. And he says, you guys are living the American dream. He says, how long have you been doing it this way? I've been working with you for a long time because everything you do works. How long have you been doing it this way? I think we answered 14 years, 16 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. Okay? So how you cut costs in your cost structure can be very disruptive to what people are expecting from you. You can work at a hub. You can have an office there where you can use the office there. And that becomes your business center. Okay. Oh, by the way, the University of New Mexico has a uh, at global rainforest does have a deal that they do with students to rent offices if you're a student starting up a company. You might want to contact me to Kara or Cecilia and talk about whether or not there's available space. And is it value driven? So cost driven or value driven? Value driven is just a nice way of saying people value it so they're going to buy it at a higher price than you would manage it. How many of you ever imagined we would pay $1,000 for a mobile phone? Well, we do. It's called an Apple. And it's called an Apple X. And we think it's lovely. We buy all these beautiful covers for it. I mean, it's just a plastic cover for 50 bucks because it's got a bunch of things on that cover that we like. So actually, we're paying $1,050 for that phone. 
So value driven means what are they willing to pay because they think it serves a high value and need for them. And in my case, my, my phone is my computer, it is my phone, it is my internet connection, and it's my connection with all kinds of people through photographs. Okay? So I value it very highly. Other people may not. Okay? So you have to figure out what value does it create to the customer? Can we drive the price that way? Some more information about cost structure and some of the things I was talking about. I'll kind of let you take a look at this. There are such things as fixed, fixed costs, which are salary, salaries, rents, and utilities. In the case of the company I told you that I had, one of the companies that I had, we, it was, there were no rents and there were no utilities. It was just salaries. Um, are there variable costs? Like in the beginning, it's going to cost us 40000 to build it, but in nine months, it's only going to cost us $25,000. Um, are some of the things we're buying from it going to vary in, in cost? We know that the chips we need are going up in price. Are there economies of scale? Um, you know, it's really interesting. When you're first starting off a company, um, I'm not expecting you to know too much about economies of scale. Whereas if you come up with a minimum viable product, you can do that for a while and make money before you have to add more whistles and bells to it, like Apple did with its computers. But I am not expecting that in the beginning, um, but eventually you're going to have to address that issue. And then economies of scope. Everybody in the world is my customer. I'm going to go to a mass market and it's going to do everything everybody wants. We have to say to ourselves, if we draw back on the following things and we can get it out this way, can we create the revenues that we need in order to get to that point at some point? So revenue streams, again, those same questions. For what are customers willing to pay? What do they currently pay? How are they currently paying? How would they prefer to pay? And how much does each revenue stream contribute to overall revenues? Uber is a good example of this. All of you probably use Uber. You need a ride at 5.30 in the morning to get to the airport. You pull up the Uber, you schedule it the day before, you pay for it with PayPal or your <coughs> credit card, and it's taken care of, and you can at the end out on a tip or give a tip, and it's all there in your hand on your phone. So how I prefer to pay is that painless. I like that. I don't have to worry about it, and I can race to my plane. The business model canvas is a tool. We've taught you a new model, hopefully a new language, and it's a practical tool because when I mentor companies and work with them and they've started to answer those questions, I know it's missing. I know what they need to work on. We do that through the i program. It helps craft a new business model or analyze or revitalize an old one. We may find, and several companies have found this, that they're just not selling enough. But the minute they say we gotta do this differently, they do. It's the difference between in 1984 the little tiny boxy Max, and in 1996, this really beautiful, multicolored, shiny, purple and crystal computer that everybody wanted, okay? So we had to modify that product, same product, and we also had to make sure that the operating system was inside of it instead of a disk that we inserted, and now we totally changed the product we're doing. We really had to revitalize the old one. Next steps, what do you do after this class is over with? Well, first of all, uh, we're going to have a quiz that we're going to launch for you to get credit for it. And you'll be working with Cecilia Pacheco and Kara to do that. But take the time to complete your business model for your idea. Save yourself its rough draft number one of seven, because you're going to redo it several times. Use stickies on your, on your computer. Um, I love stickies on my computer. I've, I've got a really fancy Dell that I can write on, and um, I like my stickies. I put them all over stuff, and they're done electronically. They're not over. Collaborate and brainstorm with friends or their family or business associates. There's a very fine line over whether or not you should be working alone as an entrepreneur. There's evidence to show that it works. There's also evidence to show that it's not nearly as creative. So what you want to do is say, hey, Dad, I'll buy you a beer. Sit down with me. Hey, brother, sit down with me. I'll buy you a beer and work with me and fill this out. One of the most fabulously successful of the entrepreneurs I worked with in the last i group sat in the brewery owns because he was putting together a distribution system with his business model. And somebody took a, fa a photograph of him working on it. And pretty soon everybody came in and wanted to do stickies and write it down and tell them why they came here. So you're, you're going to be surprised how much value there is in collaboration. Record all ideas, avoid editing. Oh my goodness, brainstorming means that no idea is a bad idea. Somebody may come up with something you don't like, don't say that. You want them to be very interested in your success. 
then do customer discovery. Hey, Susan, can I come back and talk with you and ask you know, about my product? Hey, Cecilia, can I come back and ask you about my product? Hey, Wayne, can I come back and ask you about my product? This is only your first step. Um, but this is not a business plan. This is your business model, Canvas. The whole idea of you have everything in place to start launching your business model and talking to investors. Based on customer discovery, you will probably reinvent, and now I'm using initials, BMC, your business model canvas. It does not take the place of a business plan. Aha, uh -huh, but in the beginning stages, they probably want you to have an executive summary, and it does create your executive summary. You just need to use this for it. Many pre-A and A investors don't look for a business plan. They're looking at you. We've talked about this in multiple workshops. 90% of their decision is you, your confidence, and did you do this right? Once it's completed after one to seven iterations, maybe more, it can be used to create your executive summary and it helps you see patterns that facilitate your design. You're sitting there looking at answers from customers and you're saying to yourself to get it to them fast, I have to negotiate a bigger number of these being me or I have to make them different, okay? And I think we have no more slides. We're done. How about that? So it's five minutes to 11. I want to thank you for the time you spent with us. If you've got any questions, back at the beginning, and I'm going to race through these things, you can call or preferably email Susan Cornelius, scornelius at ssolutions.cc, and it really is .cc. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Susan Cornelius. And that's my mobile phone number. Leave a message, I'll get back to you. So if there are no further questions, hopefully you've had a good time listening to this. We've taken a dry subject and really explained why it's needed, help you be passionate about it, and help you get started. Thank you for your time.